As in all cases, the findings of science are far more awe-inspiring than the rantings of the godly. The history of the cosmos begins, if we use the word time to mean anything at all, about 12 billion years ago. If we use the word time wrongly, we shall end up with the infantile computation of the celebrated Archbishop James Usher of Armagh, who calculated that the Earth, the Earth alone, mind you, not the cosmos, had its birthday on Saturday, October 22nd, in 4004 BC, at six in the afternoon. This dating was endorsed by William Jennings Bryan, the former American Secretary of State and two-time Democratic presidential nominee in courtroom testimony in the third decade of the 20th century. The true age of the sun and its orbiting planets, one of them destined to harbor life and all the others doomed to lifelessness, is perhaps four and a half billion years and subject to revision. This particular microscopic solar system most probably has at least that long again to run its fiery course. The life expectancy of our sun is a solid five billion more years. However, mark your calendar, at around that point, it will emulate millions of other suns and explosively mutate into a swollen red giant, causing the Earth's oceans to boil and extinguishing all possibility of life in any form. No description by any prophet or visionary has even begun to picture the awful intensity and irrevocability of that moment. One has at least some pitiful self-centered reason not to fear undergoing it. On current projections, the biosphere will very probably have been destroyed by different and slower sorts of warming and heating in the meantime. As a species on Earth, according to many sanguine experts, we do not have many more eons ahead of us. With what contempt and suspicion, then, must one regard those who are not willing to wait, and who beguile themselves and terrify others, especially the children, as usual? with horrific visions of apocalypse, to be followed by stern judgment from the one who supposedly placed us in this inescapable dilemma to begin with. We may laugh now at the foam-flecked hell and damnation preachers who love to shrivel young souls with pornographic depictions of eternal torture. But this phenomenon has reappeared in a more troubling form with the holy alliance between the believers and what they can borrow or steal from the world of science. Here is Professor Purvez Hoodboy, a distinguished professor of nuclear and high energy physics at the University of Islamabad in Pakistan, writing about the frightening mentality which prevails in his country, one of the world's first states to define its very nationality by religion. In a public debate on the eve of the Pakistani nuclear tests, the former chief of the Pakistani army, General Mirza Aslam Beg, said, we can make a first strike and a second and even a third. The prospect of nuclear war left him unmoved. You can die crossing the street, he said, or you could die in a nuclear war. You've got to die someday anyway. India and Pakistan are largely traditional societies where the fundamental belief structure demands disempowerment and surrender to larger forces. A fatalistic Hindu belief that the stars above determine our destiny, or the equivalent Muslim belief in kismet, certainly account for part. I shall not disagree with the very brave Professor Hoodboy who helped alert us to the fact that there were several secret bin Laden supporters among the bureaucrats of the Pakistani nuclear program. And you also exposed the wild fanatics within that system who hoped to harness the power of the mythical jinns or desert devils for military purposes. In his world, the enemies are mainly Muslims and Hindus. But within the Judeo-Christian world also, there are those who like to fantasize about a final conflict and embellish the vision with mushroom-shaped clouds. It is a tragic and potentially lethal irony that those who most despise science and the method of free inquiry should have been able to pilfer from it and annex its sophisticated products to their sick dreams. The death wish, or something not unlike it, may be secretly present in all of us. At the turn of the year 1999 into 2000, many educated people talked and published infinite nonsense about a series of possible calamities and dramas. This was no better than primitive numerology. In fact, it was slightly worse in that 2000 was only a number on Christian calendars. And even the stoutest defenders of the Bible story now admit that if Jesus was ever born, it wasn't until at least AD 4. The occasion was nothing more than an odometer for idiots who sought the cheap thrill of impending doom. But religion makes such impulses legitimate and claims the right to officiate at the end of life, just as it hopes to monopolize children at life's beginning. There can be no doubt that the cult of death 
and the insistence upon portents of the end proceed from a surreptitious desire to see it happen and to put an end to the anxiety and doubt that always threaten the hold of faith. When the earthquake hits, or the tsunami inundates, or the twin towers ignite, you can see and hear the secret satisfaction of the faithful. Gleefully they strike up. You see, this is what happens when you don't listen to us. With an unctuous smile, they offer a redemption that is not theirs to bestow, and when questioned, put on the menacing scowl that says, Oh, so you reject our offer of paradise? Well, in that case, we have quite another fate in store for you. Such love, such care. The element of the wish for obliteration can be seen without disguise in the millennial sects of our own day, who betray their selfishness as well as their nihilism by announcing how many will be saved from the ultimate catastrophe. Here, the extreme Protestants are almost as much at fault as the most hysterical Muslims. In 1844, one of the greatest American religious revivals occurred, led by a semi-literate lunatic named George Miller. Mr. Miller managed to crowd the mountaintops of America with credulous fools who, having sold their belongings cheap, became persuaded that the world would end on October 22nd of that year. They removed themselves to high ground. What difference did they expect that to make? Or to the roofs of their hovels? When the ultimate failed to arrive, Miller's choice of terms was highly suggestive. It was, he announced, the great disappointment. In our own time, Mr. Hal Lindsay, author of the best-selling The Late Great Planet Earth, has betrayed the same thirst for extinction. Indulged by senior American conservatives and respectfully interviewed on TV, Mr. Lindsay once dated the start of The Tribulation, a seven-year period of strife and terror, for 1988. That would have produced Armageddon itself, the closure of the tribulation, in 1995. Mr. Lindsay may be a charlatan, but it is a certainty that he and his followers suffer from a persistent feeling of anticlimax. Antibodies to fatalism and suicide and masochism do exist, however, and are just as innate in our species. There is a celebrated story from Puritan Massachusetts in the late 18th century. During a session of the state legislature, the sky suddenly became leaden and overcast at midday. Its threatening aspect, a darkness at noon, convinced many legislators that the event so much on their clouded minds was imminent. They asked to suspend business and to go home to die. The Speaker of the Assembly, Abraham Davenport, managed to keep his nerve and dignity. Gentlemen, he said, either the Day of Judgment is here or it is not. If it is not, there is no occasion for alarm and lamentation. If it is, however, I wish to be found doing my duty. I move, therefore, that candles be brought. In his own limited and superstitious day, this was the best that Mr. Davenport could do.